Well, it's a privilege to be with you this morning <clears throat> to bring you the Word of God. And we're going to look at a, a really familiar text, uh, most of you know, um, concerning our walk with the Lord and how we live it out in the strength and power of God. So <clears throat> before I read that text, let's go ahead and ask the Lord to bless this time together in His Word. <clears throat> Father, we thank You so much that we can be here together this morning. I thank You that we still have that freedom to gather, to proclaim the good news of the beauty and glory and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that He would be set on display this morning that you, Father, would be set on display as we talk about what it means to walk with you, as we talk about what you do in the lives of your children and, and, and how it costs you to be able to do that, and yet uh, this supernatural reality of life with you that's a gift from you to us through the gospel. So I just pray, help me uh, to give me strength and clear thinking and set a watch over my lips. As the truth is declared, and may you penetrate hearts, <clears throat> those who are here that know and love you, may you drive home the truth of this passage to our hearts, cause us to respond in the power of the Spirit to what we hear. And for those who've walked in the door who do not know you, I pray, dear Spirit of God, that you would truly open eyes to see what it means to fear you in a right sense, <clears throat> for the glory of your name. So thank you, Lord, for this time. Please bless it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Passage this morning is Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Paul said, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, the reason I wanted to uh, look at this text is because I've been asking the question, uh, as I've read it uh, over again and again, why Paul commands us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why did he not say something like, work out your salvation... Work out your salvation with faith and love. Makes sense. Or work out your salvation with hope and joy. <clears throat> Why does he highlight fear and trembling? I've read this verse many times without asking this question. Maybe you have wrestled through it. Possibly. I don't know. Uh, but I have not until just recently uh, trying to understand why Paul does this. So this morning, I want to, to spend our time reflecting on this profound statement by Paul and how it impacts our Christian walk. Let's begin then by looking at the context in which we find our text. Just in terms of a broad context, Philippians is one of the prison epistles <clears throat> written by Paul when he was in prison in Rome, probably around 61, 62, it's, uh, along with Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, it's this group of epistles that are called the prison epistles. He initially writes to thank the Philippians for their love gift, and he does address certain issues and problems in the church. Uh, but the key theme, according to one commentator, is this. <clears throat> Though many exhortations and challenges are given, one major theme or emphasis pervades the book. <clears throat> All the teachings are expressions or ramifications of this one central truth. This theme is living the Christian life and, and living it with joy. Living it with joy. So now let's zero in a little bit on, uh, on our text and its context, its immediate context. And you notice in verse 12, Paul says, So then, <clears throat> well, that, that causes you to reflect upon what he's just been talking about. The so then, which looks back uh, to the preceding context, probably goes back as far as chapter 1, 27, and then up through 12, <clears throat> 11. 
This means that our text this morning falls immediately on the heels of Paul's exhortation to manifest the attitude of Christ Jesus as he sets forth the unfathomable humility of the Son of God, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This then resulted in his supreme exaltation by God, giving him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the humility of Christ in his suffering servant cross work followed by His resurrection and exaltation to the glory of God the Father, sets the stage for our text. And it's very important that we keep this magnificent, glorious reality of His exaltation to the Father's glory in mind as we talk about what's in our text. The stage is set. So then, my beloved... Just as you have always obeyed, now, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God, this God of glory, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Essentially, Paul, I think, is saying that working out our salvation is about reflecting the beauty of Christ and His humble obedience to God in our lives to the glory of God as we wait for and anticipate His glorious exaltation at His second coming. But notice the motive that Paul uses to uh, exhort us with. He says, work out your salvation. And what does he say? we are supposed to have that motivates that. It's certainly not a motivation that has to do with how others view you or think about you or witness what you do. Paul said this motive transcends whether he's with them or apart from them. He says believers are to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. It's not about looking good in the eyes of others. So let's talk about it. First, working out is simply the idea of living out your Christian life, walking with God. It is the gracious part of God's saving gift of eternal life that has to do with our progressive sanctification, being changed more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. It involves what Ken preached earlier on in Romans, a life manifesting the obedience of of faith, obedience that is sourced out of faith. It is a lifelong good fight of faith, a fight, but a good fight by the grace of God that continues to a believer's last breath and that lays hold of Christ when that last breath is gone. But it's a supernatural fight. It's a supernatural fight that's motivated by supernatural, spirit-sourced means of grace. And here Paul says that the supernatural means of grace that motivate this working out of our salvation is fear and trembling in the presence of God. Again, why that? Why fear and trembling and not some other means? of motivating grace like love or hope or joy. Well, as we answer this question today, I want to look at three things. First, we're just going to talk about what it means to fear and tremble before God. Second, 
very simply, why should we fear and tremble before God? Why? <clears throat> and third, I want you to see how the new heart that God gives us when he saves us is the source of both fear of God and love for God. I want you to see that. I want you to see that. It's very important. <clears throat> so what does it mean to fear and tremble before God? The term fear <clears throat> is the Greek word phobos and can mean you know, simply that, fear, alarm, or fright, uh, responding to some intimidating or alarming force or threat. It can be caused by a supernatural display of God's power, for sure. Um, for example, it's used that way in Mark 4.41. You remember when the disciples were <clears throat> in threat of losing their lives on the sea and the waves were crashing and they wake Jesus up and he stands up and he stills the storm with a word. And then it says, when that happened, they became very much afraid. Fear. Alarm. Fright. Became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? It, it's the kind of fear <clears throat> that marks the unregenerate when they're facing God and his judgment. When it starts to dawn on them, What's going to happen? It's that kind of fear. It's mentioned in Revelation 11, 11, when uh, the two witnesses are put to death and everybody's cheering and exulting and it says, but after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet, the witnesses, and were taken up to heaven and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Afraid, fear. Now, with respect to God and the relationship of his people with him, <clears throat> the word means to have a proper reverential fear and awe and respect for him. And even as I say that, it's, we're going to see it's difficult to keep that in mind moment by moment in the daily battle. But that's what it is, a proper reverential awe and respect. <clears throat> this is where the lexicon places uh, our verse, Philippians 2.12. And other similar verses are placed there, like 2 Corinthians 7.1, where Paul says, Therefore, <clears throat> having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Fear of God. Acts 9.31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up <clears throat> and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. The passage Sean read, 1 Peter 1, 17 and 18, which is kind of Peter's version of Paul's of Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Peter says this, If you address his father, and, and professing Christians address him as father, if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, and you know that, that there's, there's fear in the reality that he is an impartial judge. And so <clears throat> we acknowledge that. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. I, I think we're going to see that this fear and trembling in his presence, we're going to see it's related to how he's working in his children, but it's also related to the fact that it cost him to be able to do what he does in us. Cost him. The death of his own son, the crushing of his own son. The term trembling is the Greek tramos, and it just means to tremble or quiver from fear or astonishment. 
The two words are often used together to speak about a genuine attitude of sincere humility and dependence on God, I think, in submitting to the sovereign will of God in the circumstances of life, knowing that He has ordained those circumstances, that He's in control of those circumstances. So as you're relating to others, like the servant in Ephesians chapter 6, 5 through 8, Paul says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. This is what God has given you, your lot in life, but, but do it with fear and trembling. In, in, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service, as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. I think here in Philippians 2.12, <clears throat> Paul is focusing our attention on the reality that we are living out every moment of our Christian life in the very presence of God himself. But not just that. The presence of God who, this God who is directly and immediately active in your life. If you're a Christian, active. He's not just sitting, standing by. He's working in his children. There is to be a constant, I think, or we, we fight for this, but there's to be a constant conscious awareness of the one in whose presence we are living out our obedience coupled with a constant reverential awe and humble respect, fear, for the one who is working within us to accomplish his purpose. This is an awesome Truth contained in this verse. Paul is saying that a proper fear of God is to be an ongoing reality as we walk with Him moment by moment, experiencing His transforming power. He's the one at work, transforming you. So why should we fear and tremble before God as we live out every moment? of our lives in His presence? Well, I just kind of answered that, number one. We'll talk some more about it because it is God Himself. It is God Himself who is at work in us. The true and the living God. Second, we're going to, we can see from our text, because He has commanded us to do it for our good. It's a command. And third, it's important to understand that to not do this results in eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. We need to fear because the living God, the living God is intimately and directly involved in our lives if you're a child of God. I believe that on a daily basis, I know it's true for me, <laughs> it's so easy to lose sight of the one we are dealing with, the one who is dealing with us. The one who is at work in us, both to will and work for his good pleasure. Who is this being we are dealing with and who is dealing with us? I think, dear people, every day we need to fight to reflect on the absolute infinite holiness of the God in whose presence we are working out our salvation and who is working in us. Every day we need to pray for the experience of the prophet Isaiah to be ours through eyes of faith. Every day we need to journey with the Apostle John into the very throne room of God and through the Scriptures with eyes of faith behold the beauty of the holiness and unfathomable greatness of our God and reflect on the infinite majesty of the one in whose very presence we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling because of who he is and what he is doing. 
Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4 give us the inspired accounts of Isaiah's and John's visions of the glory of God recorded for us in the inspired scriptures. Why, why have these accounts been given to us? Why are they there? I think they've been given to us so that we can, we can read them and we can deeply reflect and meditate on the, as much as we can on the infinite beauty and holiness of our great Creator God. You can't read these texts and not be immediately drawn into the sense of His holy presence. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, death I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Wow, lofty and exalted. We can't even understand with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face. These are absolutely holy, perfect beings in the presence of this God, covering their faces. With two more wings he covered his feet. It's, 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 it's acknowledging I'm a creature in the presence of the Creator Himself. And with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Absolutely other than the creation. The whole earth is full of His glory. The whole earth is full of His glory. His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature clearly seen everywhere you look of this great Creator God. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke that the, the Shekinah glory of God that filled the temple where priests couldn't even begin to stand because of His holy presence. Then Isaiah said, Woe is me, woe is me, for I am ruined, I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues, touched my mouth with it. Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. Oh, praise God for His grace. We're going to talk more about that. In Revelation chapter 4, John, let's join him just for a few seconds. He's called up to heaven, and it says, John says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne once again was standing in heaven. And there was one sitting on the throne, and he can't even begin to describe him. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were these 24 elders who sat on thrones, clothed in white garments, crowns on their heads. And from this throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. This is a holy God who judges sin. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The Holy Spirit of God is represented. And before the throne, something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And it has to do with His being separated from even those in heaven because of who He is, how holy He is. And then there's those four living creatures that you can't even begin to understand. Eyes all around and they do not cease to say constantly, like in Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. 
And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the elders then, they fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him and throw their crowns before him. And and, and they're, they're saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive this glory and honor and power. Here's why. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and are created. He spoke and it happened. (laughs) The uncreated creator with infinite power brings creation into existence with a word. Holy are you. No one is like you. There's no being like this anywhere. Only one. One being like this. Now let's return to Isaiah I want, to sp- I want to read some thoughts about his experience that come from R.C. Sproul's book, The Holiness of God. I- maybe you've read it. It's a wonderful book that talks about the holiness of God. We need a heavy, healthy dose of this. So it's just fun to read it. So I picked it, and I, I want you to listen to what he says. If ever there was a man of integrity... It was Isaiah ben Amoz. He was a whole man, a together type of fellow. I like that. He was considered by his contemporaries as the most righteous man in the nation, a righteous guy. He was respected as a paragon of virtue. Then he caught one sudden glimpse of a holy God. In that single moment, All of his self-esteem was shattered. In a brief second, he was exposed, made naked beneath the gaze of the absolute standard of holiness. As long as Isaiah could compare himself to other mortals, you know how we do that, he was able to sustain uh, an opinion, maybe a lofty opinion of his own character. You know... But the instant he measured himself by the ultimate standard, he was destroyed. Morally and spiritually annihilated, he was undone. Woe is me. (laughs) Woe is me. He came apart. His sense of integrity collapsed. In a flash of the moment, Isaiah had a new radical understanding of sin itself. He saw that it was pervasive in himself and in everyone else. Can you imagine? For the first time in his life, Isaiah really understood who God was. At the same instant, for the first time, Isaiah really understood who Isaiah was. Isaiah was groveling on the floor. Every nerve fiber in his body was trembling. He was looking for a place to hide, maybe praying that somehow the earth would cover him or the roof of the temple would fall upon him. Anything to get out from under the holy gaze of God, penetrating him. But there was nowhere to hide. How do you hide from God? He was naked and alone before God. And I'm telling you people, without what happens to Isaiah and without without that which is available to us in Christ, every person will stand naked and alone before God, gazing into the face of absolute holiness and purity. Sproul says he was his was pure moral anguish the kind that rips out the heart of a man and tears his soul to pieces. Guilt, guilt, guilt. Relentless guilt screamed from his every pore. I think that's fair. But here's the marvel of it all. But the holy God whom he stood before is also a God of grace. God of grace. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it 
and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Oh, that's what we need, isn't it? Dear people, this great creator God of infinite holiness, who called 1,500 billion galaxies, some think maybe more, 1,500 billion galaxies into existence by the sheer word of His power is the being we are dealing with and who is dealing with us. Is it any wonder? Is it any wonder that Paul commands us to work out our salvation in His presence with fear And trembling? It is this God who is at work in his people, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He is ultimately the one who is assuring that you, if you are his child, receive every aspect of the great salvation he has promised you in Christ to the praise of the glory of his grace. I think this work by God in us promotes fear and trembling because it means that there's no room in the professing Christian's life for a flippant, casual attitude or approach toward living out this life. There's no room in a true believer for a presumptuous, indifferent attitude toward a holiness of life that reflects the work of this holy God within him or her. We are to diligently pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We are told that God disciplines every son and daughter he receives so that we will share his holiness. That's good for us. He is at work within each of his children conforming them into the image of His Son so that one glorious eschatological day, Jesus will be the firstborn among many brethren. There's a goal. This work of God in His children by grace through faith begins by grace through faith in the death and resurrection of His beloved Son is a reality in every one of them. Without the saving grace of the Father, there is no hope for anyone to stand one day before the blazing glory of His infinite holiness and survive. You will not survive. So let me just pause and ask you if you're working out this salvation with fear and trembling today. Because the holy God of all glory is at work in you, both to will and to do and work for his good pleasure, causing you to fear him and reflect more and more of the beauty of his son. Has your sin been taken away, not by, not by a coal from the altar, but by the infinitely precious blood, as Sean read, of the Lamb, so that one day by His grace you'll be able to stand in His holy presence and instead of being consumed and here, depart from me, I never knew you, you'll be able to behold the very glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ for all eternity. If this is not true for you this morning, I plead with you to come to Christ. Run into his arms. Embrace him by faith. As your sin bearer, as the one who stands under that blazing holiness of God and takes all the fierce wrath of God directed toward you on himself so that you can be treated like a son and not an enemy. Run into the arms of Christ, please. 
being covered by his blood is the only way to stand before this God one day. So first then we fear and tremble before God because of who he is and because of what he's doing within us. But please note that this fear and trembling is not optional. Boy, I sure hope they fear and tremble before me. That'd be a good thing for them. No, this is a command from God. Work it out with fear and trembling, your salvation. It is a command by the one who is infinitely holy as we live out our life in his presence. It is a motive for holy living. This fear is a motive for holy living. We'll see that. It's important. And you know, this is nothing new. The Old Testament is just chock full of texts where God demands that those in covenant relationship with Him fear Him and obey Him out of that fear. I'll just read a few this morning. Deuteronomy 6.13, You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship Him and swear by His name. Deuteronomy 13.4, You shall follow the Lord your God and fear Him. You shall keep His commandments, listen to His voice, serve Him and cling to Him. Psalm 33, 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Psalm 33, 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I like this one, Proverbs 23, 17. Do not let your heart envy sinners, dear saints, but live in the fear of the Lord always, always. Here's a key implication. Fearing God is the primary characteristic that separates the righteous from the wicked. The righteous from the wicked. You remember in Romans... As Paul condemns both Jew and Gentile before God in Romans 3, 9 through 18, he sums up the unregenerate heart, sums up the unregenerate heart by saying what? In verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear. That's why our nation is in such a mess. No fear of God. Without this fear within you people, you're on the broad road that leads to eternal destruction. Revelation 11, 15 through 18. At the end of it all, as the kingdom of Christ is being established, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones, they, they fall down and worship God, saying, we give thanks to you, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. What's the response of the nations? Psalm 2. And the nations were enraged when he rules. And your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name the small and the great, and to destroy all the rest, those who destroy the earth. Dear people, only those who fear God's holy and awesome name will experience consummated kingdom blessings with Christ and God forever. Only those. Well, maybe like me this morning, my focus for quite a long time, not a bad focus, has been on the reality of my love relationship with God. Enjoying the love He has for us, for you. Poured out within your heart by the Holy Spirit. Remember Romans 5, 5, that great message Ken preached, how God does that? And delighting in Him as you love Him in return. Isn't love for God the primary gift I receive from God? 
when he saves me and takes out that dead heart of stone and gives me a heart of flesh, a living heart toward him, isn't this heart filled with love for God, how he causes me to walk in his commandments as I obey him out of love for him? Didn't Jesus say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments? Isn't my love for him enough to keep me persevering on the narrow path that leads to life? And you know, fundamentally, I've been so blessed by John Piper's ministry, focusing on that reality, joy, love, relationship with Christ. And fun, so fundamentally, I'd answer these questions with a resounding yes. But, but dear people, after reflecting on Philippians 2, 12 and 13, and many other Old and New Testament texts, I would tell you that God not only gives his children a new heart that loves him, but he gives them a new heart that also fears him, that fears him. And that both the motives of love for God and fear of God drive the obedient life that the believer lives by grace through faith to the glory of God. Love for God and fear of God come together. They work together in the new heart of every believer. And both are necessary emotions for persevering in the faith. You need both. You need both. In a New Covenant text, this was kind of a revelation for me. I was reading through Jeremiah, and I came to a text in Jeremiah 32. God makes it clear that one of the marvelous things that He does for those who are recipients of His New Covenant saving grace, and we're going to celebrate that at the Lord's table. Is to put the fear of himself within every one of his children. This is marvelous. Speaking to Israel as he does in the new, probably a text we're all more familiar with, the new covenant text in the preceding chapter, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. You know, I'm not going to remember your sins anymore. It's wonderful. It's about knowing him. God tells his people here, that when he fulfills his promised new covenant blessing with them to bring about their redemption and restoration, he tells them in this passage in Jeremiah 32 that he will take the initiative to solve one of their greatest problems throughout their history, a lack of fear of him resulting in his righteous judgment of them. They feared other false gods instead of him. But he's going to change that. We read in Jeremiah 32, 38 through 40. This is what we read. They shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way. That they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. And here it is, New Covenant. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. That's the new covenant. That I will not turn away from them to do them good. And he says, God says, God says, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. That's absolute, that's concrete, that's a promise for every child of God. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Dear people, my point today is that both love for God and fear of God are given to every one of his children who are recipients of salvation in Jesus Christ, and both love and fear work together in his children to keep them persevering in the faith until they take their last breath. Let me encourage you to cultivate through diligent study of the Scriptures both your love for God and your fear of God because both are necessary as a part of your walk with the Lord and they feed each other. The more fear and reverence and awe and respect you have for Him, the more love you have for Him. The more you love Him, the more you fear Him. We're just about done. So before we close, let me share some implications. I just want to share my heart with you about some things that 
Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Stir up. First, let me just say this. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, in my opinion, is a definitive text concerning our walk with God, our progressive sanctification. It's definitive. I think this text utterly destroys any kind of man-centered view of sanctification that anchors your transformation into the image of Christ or lack thereof in human will. It's up to me. People are being told it's up to them. Some say that a believer must allow God to change them or it won't happen. I hope that's not your... You're going to allow this holy, infinitely glorious God to change you? You're going to allow Him to do that? He's at work in you to will and to do His good pleasure, which is to make you like His Son. Some say that a true believer can continue to live in bondage to pet sins. Have you heard about, you know, pet sins? Like maybe pornography or some other thing that grips you and controls you and rules over you. It's just a pet sin. I'm doing okay in the other areas, but in this area, man, I can't beat it. Really? When the living God, the creator God of the universe is working within his children to change them? You can't beat it. Some say that a person can continue to live like the world and still be on their way to heaven. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You cannot continue to live like the world and be on your way to heaven. Why? Because God is at work in his children, (laughs) bringing about change. God is doing it. Man, So, those things I just mentioned, that there's a lot of other stuff too. Flaky stuff about what it means to be a Christian and what you should expect to see in the life of a Christian or not see. It doesn't matter. How can these things be true? If the living God, the Holy One, who is the creator of the ends of the earth, is at work in the true believer to accomplish His purpose to make every one of His children like Christ. Come on. So what is the result of this direct divine work in his children? Certainly we're not talking perfection. But even the sins that we commit are part of the plan to bring glory to his name as he works in you. He doesn't stop working in you when you sin. Doesn't say that. So what what happens in his people? Philippians 2, 12 and 13 is the reason Paul declared, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. God is at work. And why he counted all things lost for the surpassing value of knowing Christ. God is at work. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 is the reason why the saints exalt in their tribulations. Romans 5, 1 through 5. That's nuts. They exalt in their tribulations because God is at work knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, a hope that will not ever put you to shame. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 is the reason why the saints at Smyrna were faithful unto death when they were persecuted to death to receive the crown of life. Why did they do that? Because it's for the glory of God, and God is at work in His children to set Himself on display as He sustains them and strengthens them and keeps them as they give their lives up. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 is the reason 
why the tribulation saints overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, not loving their lives even unto death. Why did they do that? God is at work. God is at work. Dear Christian, don't believe the enemy's lies. Only those who work out their salvation with fear and trembling will one day stand faultless before the throne of God. And they will work it out. Because the living God is at work in them both to will and to work for his good pleasure to the glory of his great name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's so powerful and clear, I think. It makes it very clear to us that the reason we will become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ in this life, the reason we will work out our salvation, live out our Christian lives, by grace through faith, is because you, Father, you, in the presence of the power of the Almighty Holy Spirit, are within us, doing in and through us and for us what we could never do for ourselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the blood of Christ that even allows that to happen in this relationship with you. You've set your affection upon us. You stir up in our hearts a proper fear of you. Oh, fan the flames, dear Spirit of God, through the Word of God, the fan the flames of love and fear, hope and joy and faith in our relationship with you. And I pray for those who don't know you, as we asked before, please, may fear of eternal judgment drive them into your arms so that they can fear you the right way as beloved children where you're working for their good, eternal good. We give this message to you, to our hearts, for the glory of Christ. Amen.